Welcome back to our short series uh, on uh, perspectives on Ukraine. Uh, today's February 2nd for, for context. Uh, who, who knows what February 5th or 17th might look like. Uh, my name is Ingo Trauschweitzer. I'm the director of the Contemporary History Institute at Ohio University. Uh, and uh, today's video features a conversation with my friend and colleague Steve Miner, professor of Russian and Soviet history here at Ohio. I start out with a open-ended question. As someone who is so familiar with the intertwined histories of, of Russia and Ukraine or the whole region, really, um, what do you make of the current crisis? Well, there are, that is, as you say, a really open-ended question. It's, it's very alarming. Uh, I, one doesn't know how serious Vlad Putin is, but we find ourselves in the, the very disturbing situation where a great deal depends on the will of a single rather uh, dictatorial or, or authorita authoritarian man. You know, Putin has a record of doing very unpleasant things, uh, murdering people that are his political opponents, um, using violence when it suits his purposes. So the amassing of over 100,000 troops on the border of Ukraine and the way that demands have been presented not as negotiating points, but as demands to be accepted, is worrisome. And it, it smacks of a different era, really. You, you mentioned a different era. And you, I guess you're, as a historian of the Stalin era, I wonder if that's the one you're referring to. But more generally, uh, what, what sort of historical analogs do you see here that, that might help us better understand this this current situation? Well, two things. One is I, I, I very much deplore the current tendency to, to make analogies to everything from Europe in the 1930s. This isn't Europe in the 1930s. Uh, everybody's not Hitler. Everybody's not Stalin. Okay, so having said that, uh, when the Soviets, the, the Russians briefly opened up their archives and then they shut them again, and particularly in related to foreign affairs. And when somebody asked them, well, why are you shutting the archives? Their answer was because geography doesn't change. And there's something to that. Uh, not everything is Stalin, and not everything certainly is Hitler, but geography doesn't change. And with geography comes certain geopolitical considerations. And Vlad Putin himself has made a particular issue of history. He, he's done something very unusual. He's written two 5,000 word articles on history. Now, he or whoever wrote it for him, I don't know. It might well have been him. But one was about the Second World War and what he called its real lessons of the Second World War, uh, which are very different from the lessons that most mainstream Western historians would, would draw. The other, though, and it's more pertinent to the current discussion, is a very long article describing why Ukraine really isn't a country and, and never really has been an independent country. His, his argument, so, so history is pertinent, not because I think it is, but because Putin has made it pertinent. Um, his, his argument boiled down to its essentials is that Ukraine and Russia had a common route back in Kievan Rus, back in the 10th century through the 13th century. Um, by the way, this, this is a very nationalist historian, yeah, no, no, nationalist history. It's not a history that any Western academic historian would subscribe to. But they had this common route that, that was, they, it was sundered by foreign intervention, first by the Mongols, later by the Poles and Lithuanians, subsequently by the Swedes, by the Germans, and so forth and so on. And that Ukraine has only ever been separated from Russia because of foreign action and foreign intervention. And the only times that it has been independent, in quotes, has been, again, as a result of foreign intervention. There's something to this, as there is with all bad history, but it's still bad history. Uh, certainly, the Ukraine gained its, its modern independence as a result of Germany in the First World War and, uh, and Germany's defeat of Tsarist Russia in the First World War. Uh, it, then again, at, at the end of, of the Civil War, it had uh, Russia's Civil War, uh, the Poles intervened and tried to create an independent uh, Poland, uh, Ukraine. And then, of course, at the end of the, of the uh, well, the Germans again in the Second World War tried to sever Ukraine off for their own purposes. But at the end of the Cold War, of course, Ukraine gains its modern independence. And in Putin's read, this is, this is serving the interests not of the Ukrainian people, 
but rather of Western people who are trying to divide Russia and keep it weak. That's his argument in a nutshell. Hmm. And, and, and so his argument is a historical one, explicitly. And so, you know, as a historian, I, I, I'm reluctant to make a lot of modern predictions because historians have a very bad track record of doing that. But when a, a major player actually uses history to make his case, I think you can fairly say, well, maybe we should uh, pay attention to what he's saying. And and of course, it's a, as you say, a particular reading of that history on on Very the much so. Um, so I was actually going to going to sort of ask about whether whether you know Putin's policies are rooted in history. I'm wondering if if Ukrainian concerns and fears might be then rooted in history too, from yeah from the side of the of the coin here? Explicitly so. The, the, the Ukrainians, you know, it's, it's a fair question. What creates a nation? What, why does a group of people suddenly become a nation? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite question of historians. And one is a sort of shared experience, shared history, shared uh, uh, geography. But a, a certainly a very important element in a sense really of grievance uh, of, of people who feel that they've been mistreated by another country. And the Ukrainians do feel this, uh, many Ukrainians do, dating back at least to the 1930s, but certainly even before then. The 1930s, of course, you had Stalin's collectivization of the farms in which millions of Ukrainians died in what the, the Ukrainians called the Golodomor, or the, 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 the terror or hunger famine, intentionally to drive them into collective farms. Uh, the, the Russian answer to that, and I don't think it's much of an answer, is, well, it wasn't just you that died. They killed Russians as well. I don't know that that's a particularly persuasive comeback, but it is the Russian comeback. Um, so so if, you, if you define yourself to some, some senses by what you're not, and that's very frequently a, a sort of national, a, a def definition of nationalism. For example, Canadians define themselves as North Americans who aren't from the U.S., uh, very much so. Um, so if you define yourself in negative terms, the irony is that what Putin is doing is actually creating Ukrainian nationalism where it wasn't particularly strong. At the end of the Soviet Union, he, I mean, he's right in the sense that Ukraine has a weak history of national independence, a weak and very recent history of national independence. But his treatment of Ukrainians has created you, uh, nationalist enthusiasm where it didn't exist before. At the end of the Cold War, a number of, of surveys were done about public opinion in Ukraine. Do you want to be, do you identify as Russian? Do you identify as Ukrainian? Would you like to be a member of Russia or of Ukraine? And the numbers were quite, quite high saying, I want, I'm a Russian, I, I speak Russian, I identify with Russia, particularly in, in the Eastern portions of Ukraine, where you have a lot of ethnic Russians or a lot of intermarriages between Russians and Ukrainians. Uh, a lot of Russians were concerned that their language would be, uh, for not, if not forbidden, then at least not used in public discourse and that sort of stuff. Um, now, if you take the same public opinion surveys, there's a wildly strong Ukrainian nationalism because they've been beat up by Putin's thugs in, 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 uh, uh, in Donetsk and Luhansk and elsewhere. And there's a sense that, wait a minute, you, you can't treat us like this. And uh, we don't want to be Russian. If this is what being Russian means, we don't want to be Russian. Well, that makes sense. I, I, because we, I think we tend to forget about the 2014, uh, well, invasion and right. the acquisition of the Crimea. Um, and, and so I guess my, my final question then is how much of what you what what you just explained do you think is in fact understood by Western actors, uh, whether it's in the U.S. or or in NATO or in Europe, um, or are they missing that 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 sort of historical trajectory, which would of course kind of affect how they how they read the crisis and how they how they react? So if you think about you know public comments and commentary uh, on a on a daily basis, or the U.S. Uh, starting to send troops to Europe. Uh, as of as of this morning, I think the first three thousand to to various various partners is that 
do you see a sort of a sound reading of that history uh, behind that or, or a lack thereof? Uh, I think it depends on who you talk to. Uh, if you open up the newspapers or you listen to public actors, what you are struck by is not the unanimity of opinion, but the diversity of opinion. Ukraine will be invaded. Ukraine won't be invaded. Uh, Putin is a tyrant and is pushing us around. No, how would we like it if Mexico was occupied by Russian troops? You have all sorts of commentary, a lot of it very, as you say, very ill-informed. Some of it less ill-informed in my, in my judgment, but of course my judgment is itself partial. One thing I'd like to say though is, and, and, and to some degree I agree with Gary Kasparov on this. Kasparov of course is a Russian. He was the champion, world champion of chess player. He also ran to be president of Russia and eventually was forced out of Russia because it became unsafe to be a critic of, of Putin. But he makes a point, and I would reinforce it, that Putin is always talked of in the in the West as a master strategist. How many, how many times have you heard that? He's got us over a barrel. He's a master strategist. And uh, he's, a, he's playing chess while we're playing checkers. You've heard that kind of argument. First of all, uh, if anybody's suited to explain what a chess player is, I think it's Gary Kasparov, and he says he's not a chess player. He's a poker player. He's bluffing. Um, uh, he, he's got a very weak hand. I would extend that and say that he's actually a very poor strategist. He's a good tactician. He, he makes everybody panic and dance to his tune and play his game. He's done this in Ukraine with the annexation of, of uh, Crimea, as you mentioned. He's, he's, he did it in Syria when uh, you know, uh, um, Obama tried to have a red line on, on gas and uh, he backed down and then Putin got involved. You know, any number of cases you can say he's running rings around some of the Western leaders. What I mean about it being a good tactician and a bad strategist is it's really easy to get involved in these things and it's really hard to get out of them. Something that Americans ought to know in deep in their bones. Russia is now involved, not just in Crimea. He's got troops in Georgia, in Crimea, in Syria, and in Libya, and in, and everybody forgets this one, in uh, Transnistria. These are frozen conflicts. And he's gotten involved in all of them, and he hasn't got out of any of them yet. So that's that's point number one. But so, the second point is, he is making all the same large strategic errors that his Soviet pre predecessors made. Overcommitment, uh, driving some of his best minds out, uh, hostility to the outside world, shutting Russia off to the latest uh, technical, technical, technical and technological developments. These are the things that brought the Soviet Union down. And he's replicating them, every single one of them. Uh, this is not a guy who has a long game. Uh, he, yeah, sure, he can make us all frightened because he's got a country with enough nuclear missiles to really ruin our day. Uh, and he's got a, a large army, and it's not a huge army, but it's a, a large enough army to make us all have nightmares. What people forget is he's doing all this with a very, very weak hand. This is a country that occupies a sixth of the world's surface and has a GDP about the size of Spain's. What would Spain be doing with nuclear weapons and with hundreds of thousands of troops and tanks? Uh, he's spending money on things that aren't going to improve the life of your average Russian and can't be sustained over time. He's taking on, and we're terrified, he's taking on, on uh, the EU and the United States. The United States, and, and this, I'm pulling these numbers out of, out of memory, but the American um, GDP is something between 23 and $25 trillion per year. The uh, EU is slightly higher than that. Russia's GDP per annum is $1.7 trillion. In any meaningful sense, this is a country that can't compete with the countries that he's supposedly running around. Uh, if, 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 if the West crumbles in the face of this challenge, it has nothing to blame but itself. Uh, this is not, he, his bluff needs to be called, I, I'm afraid. I mean, that doesn't mean that we need to send in troops or, but we shouldn't panic. I don't think that the man is dumb enough to get involved in a genuine shooting war that would, would involve masses of casualties. Having said that, he, he's a dictator and who knows what a dictator will do. 
And one very frightening thing that I saw reported that I haven't seen reported, I've saw it reported once and nowhere else. When um, the Russians invaded Crimea, uh, they claimed that they that this was this was local people. It wasn't it wasn't Russians. And when they invaded Luhansk and Donetsk, it was it was these were volunteers. It had nothing to do with Russia. Um, Memorial and some other civic groups in Russia went and found notices of burials and found out that a lot of Russian soldiers were being buried because it was it was required by law to register births uh, to register deaths. Excuse me of military people. They changed that law the other day. They also shut down Memorial, which was the group yeah. that had uh, had registered these things. Uh, that's a really worrisome thing to me. That's like, that's like the, the you're, you're a historian of the American military. It's like the American mili- uh, uh, Pentagon suddenly ordering lots of pizzas to be delivered. Uh, it, you know, it's a sign that some, uh, some kind of intervention is gonna take place. Why would you do that if you didn't expect to see bodies? So, well, so there's there's reason to worry, but it would be it would be quite illogical to fight a war against uh, an, an enemy that really is much 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 more powerful. Well, that's a, that uh, I think the, the 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 weakness of 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 Russia and also the kind of parallels to the collapse of the Soviet Union are, uh, in fact, not something we 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 think about very much in public discourse about this. Uh, well, thank you very much, Steve. It's great. Can, can I just say one more thing? Oh, of course. Uh, they, the people are, are often say that uh, Putin's real concern is the expansion of NATO. Uh, I actually don't believe that. I think that he realizes that NATO is kind of like Poland in the 18th century. It has a liberum veto, and any single uh, state can veto any kind of action. His real concern, this is a man who, what did he live through? What's the, the, the seminal experience of Vladimir Putin? He served the Soviet state and saw it collapse around him. And what has he seen in Eastern Europe since? The color revolutions. This is a man who, as he approaches 70, is afraid of his own people and is afraid that the, the peasants are gonna come with, with torches. And he, he, he doesn't want to die like Gaddafi did or any number of other dictators have. And that's his real concern. And uh, you know, we, we always think, oh, well, why can't we have a cooperative relationship with Putin? What I would say is, if you're Putin and the United States says we want a good cooperative relationship with you, and, and re- maybe even means it, what happens when the mob starts approaching the Kremlin? Is the United States going to be on the side of Putin or is the, are they going to be on the side of the mob? He knows, and you know, we all know. Uh, when when the riots started in Moscow, there's no, there's not going to be any support for Putin. It's going to vanish, and he knows that. And so cooperation with the United States or the Western powers to him is comes at a greater cost than confrontation in, in its own way. Uh, it, this is a really dangerous situation because uh, you know as as a as a dictator ages and has a weak hand, weakness can be provocative, as you well know. Well, I think that's. Collapses like that too are always dangerous too. Yeah, uh, 1991 could have played out differently. Uh, right. So thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you. I hope uh, you know people watch us get a lot out of it. Maybe your, your word in the German government's ear. I, I I kind of feel like. Uh, um, and um, no, I hope that uh, the series of recordings too from from different perspectives kind of gives a, a sense of the complexity of, of, of all of this. Yeah, yeah I, it is very complex and very worrisome. Um, there's there's no really good retirement program for aging dictators, is there? No, I guess I guess there is not. <laughs> okay.